Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good evening or good morning, depending where you are. We're going to give a couple minutes for everyone to join and, and then we'll get started. Okay, so we will go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. My name is Victoria Solkovitz and I am Meet Beam's Director of External Relations. We're really happy to have all of you here with us today, no matter uh, which time zone you might be coming from. So why are we here today? President of the United States, Joe Biden, is going to be visiting the Middle East next week between July 13th and 16th. So we're here today to have an opportunity to discuss a range of issues related to US policy in the Middle East and how it specifically impacts and refers to the state of Israel. Um, the goal of our webinar today is to understand how Biden's visit reflects American policy, how he will be promoting his political positions on a variety of topics and issues. And to do that, we're fortunate enough today to have a wide range of experts from Mikvim, from Israel Policy Forum, from Times of Israel here with us today. A little bit about the structure of our event and, and how we're going to go about everything. We are going to start first with opening presentations. Each of our speakers will have about seven minutes to talk about a particular issue. And once we go through all of these initial presentations, we'll have time for an extensive Q&A session um, on whatever topic, whatever speaker you're interested in. So, so please, throughout the event, feel free to send your messages in the chat below. You can also send them privately to, to me or to Roy. Um, but this is probably going to be the best way. We want to make sure that we're getting all of your questions throughout the event. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. And I'm actually going to start our event today with none other than Tal Schneider. Tal, a political correspondent of the Times of Israel um, and really an expert in, in US-Israel relations. Um, so Tal, hi. Uh, hi. <laughs> President Biden has continually emphasized the importance of the US-Israel relationship and especially his positive track record and the Democratic Party's track record for supporting Israel. What does this upcoming visit mean for U.S.-Israel relations? Will there be specific interests that the U.S. and Israel will promote for their relationship during this period? What's, what's the story with relations as they stand right now? So thank you. Thank you for having me and inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, I think uh, the visit is very, very important for U.S.-Israel's relationship. Uh, as we all know, Biden has been in office for a year and a half. This is the first time as a president that he will be here, but he's been here many times before uh, over uh, you know, his long uh, public career. He's been here dozens of times as a vice president. I think he's been here at least three or four times. And um, he's very engaged and very, very involved in Israel's issues. I mean, he knows a lot. He was foreign affairs. Uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, Senate Committee Chair for many years. I think he knows Israel maybe better than some of us know Israel with respect to all of our political problems and, and, and different groups and different nuance about Israel's politics, uh, going down to even different variations of the Arab society and so on. So this is a president who knows a lot. Having said that, I think we are an important stop on the way to Saudi Arabia. I think the main focus in the United States is economic and Israel is a very important partner and ally, but the main focus of his trip is the next state, uh, obviously the, uh, the Saudi Arabia. And we are very important in maintaining and making sure everything is okay, but, and obviously because we are under a campaign, he will have to meet with the former prime minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, the, the two know each other very well. He will, he will meet with uh, Israel's Prime Minister Yair Lapid. I know for a, for a fact that he will be on Thursday, he will be at um, President Herzog House for a reception. So all of these things will take place on Wednesday and Thursday. I think he lands on Wednesday late afternoon, like 5 or 6 p.m. And only on, fr on, on Thursday, he will do all of the meetings. From what I've understood, 
the schedule is still flexible. There aren't, you know, the Israeli, Israeli counterpart don't know exactly the plans, you know, minute by minute, even though we are a week before that. But uh, overall, we're definitely going to hear with him his expectation for two-state solution down the road. It's, this is a phrase that it's uh, always being, being put out, but I don't know how, I don't think there's any serious uh, intentions or agenda behind this phrase. This is just something people say, uh, they keep on saying it for so many years and they will keep on saying it. No one is really looking into dealing with the current situation where Israel's political situation is so dire. And on the other side also, um, probably no one to talk to at the moment. I mean, even, I mean, there, there is a president, but everybody, I mean, he's very old and I don't think people are counting on him for many years to come. So yeah, the Palestinian issue is uh, somewhat, you know, being spoken, but not with full intentions behind it. Great, and just, just a quick follow up on that and, and to, to go back to the relationship specifically between the Israeli government and, and the US government. Um, in your view, has Israel been able to rebuild its relations specifically with the Democratic Party? How do you kind of view the, the perception of the Israeli public towards the Democratic Party now that we're about halfway through Biden's presidency? And do you think that'll have an impact on the visit as well? Well, obviously, I do think that Israel was able to build up the, or, or repair uh, their relationship with the Democratic Party, uh, specifically with Lapid now being the prime minister is for sure. Bennett also put this, uh, the former prime minister Bennett also put this on the top of his agenda. And we have seen warm, um, you know, welcome in the White House uh, less than a year ago, um, you know, meetings with uh, congressional leaders, the entire package. We did not. We did not see the sour faces coming out from Nancy Pelosi and you know the rest of them uh, while embracing uh, the Israeli side. Um, I think that you know, as per the Israeli public, the Israeli public, the public itself, you no, know, it's not highly engaged in <coughs> the Democratic or Republican Party. But there was some concern among the chattering class with respect to the Iron Dome finance and the American administration made a long way a stretch to make sure that um, no, nobody here should be worried about that. So we did see some, um, I would say minor concerns that were taken off immediately off the table. Uh, obviously the Democratic party is going through something with respect to Israel that we, you know, we all know about. There is also one, at least one senator on the Republican side that everybody knows about, uh, the Senator Paul. Uh, and the group of uh, congressmen, people on, on the Republican, uh, on the Democratic side, I think Israel is, is following that closely, but yeah, it's not yet any, any type of concern other than just, you know, a lot of noise. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so Tal talked a little bit and touched on the Palestinian issue. And on that note, I'd like to actually move it to our director of Israeli-Palestinian peacebuilding, Dr. Lior Lairs. Um, Lior, <laughs> how would you evaluate the White House's current position towards Israeli-Palestinian peacebuilding? We know that at the beginning of President Biden's presidency and in the campaign, he made it very clear that he wasn't interested really in touching the subject. We know also that during things like the May 2021 escalation, Washington did end up getting involved. How do you evaluate where we are right now? And, and do you think he will end up putting pressure on the Israeli government during his visit or continue, continue the current course? Thank you, Victoria. It's great to be here. Uh, so I think looking back, I will try to raise a few points about in general Biden policy as you ask about Israel-Palestine and some questions maybe toward the visit next week. So first of all, I remember to, going back to Trump era uh, after the Trump administration changed some of the basic elements of the U.S. long-standing policy about Israel-Palestine. There are many discussions of how much it would be easy for the next president to reverse policy and to go back to the pre-2016 administration, Trump administration. Over time, we discovered that it's not very easy. It's more difficult than it seems. 
And we can see comparing already what we know about Trump and uh, Biden administration, that first of all, on the one hand, looking on the discourse on the statement, it's very clear that the Biden administration from the beginning, we are firm position about supporting the two-state solution, going back to the American policy about settlement, about Jerusalem. So on that aspect, it's clear. And another important policy was to recover the relation with the Palestinian Authority, with Ramallah, after the rift for three years during the Trump and the Abu Mazen era. And that was uh, significant. And also renewing some of the American aid to the Palestinian. But on the other hand, we can see some of the things, for example, of course, the American consulate in Jerusalem, that that was a basic promise during the election campaign of Biden. And it actually didn't happen. We opened in the American consulate that was there for so many years and we can see that even though it seems very easy, very simple, basic uh, uh, promise election, it didn't actually happen, of course, as part of the relation with the Israeli government when Bennett and Lapid opposed it and Biden wanted to keep the coalition alive, so it didn't happen. We can see that also with the PLO office in DC, also that was there for many, many years since the beginning of the peace process and it was closed during the Trump era and it's still closed, they didn't open it. And there you have also some legal aspects related to that. So that's why we can hear some disappointment voices coming from the Palestinian side, that even though the administration changed in Israel and in the US, the policy on the ground hasn't really, really changed. There was some discussion about appointing maybe Hadi Amar as a special envoy for the Palestinian, but it didn't really happen as a compensation. Uh, I would just add to that, as you mentioned, that from the beginning, it was clear that they are not going to bring, to try to bring peace to the Middle East and to have an Israeli-Palestinian peace. We saw that this is not a high priority for them. We saw two things. We saw one thing was what we can call conflict management or conflict, uh, try to prevent escalation. We saw that, as you mentioned, during the war, 2021, May. We saw that also recently, a few months ago. And the second thing is trying to draw a very clear red line, what not to do. For example, about the settlement expansion, about the E1, about Atarot. That was another uh, thing that we saw, but not more than that. We can see a real clear strategy about how to achieve peace or promoting how to, to move toward peace even in the next uh, months or next year. So we haven't seen that. So I will just mention that if you are trying to see towards the visit next week, we can look on a few interesting things that will be interesting to see. I think first of all, how much the Israeli, the Israeli-Palestinian issue will take place in the statements during the visit, that's the first thing. And what will be the content? If it will be just the famous slogan that we hear over and over again for the Biden administration, that Israelis and Palestinians deserve equal measures of peace, dignity, and security, or if, will be, if you will see more than that, if you will have a concrete steps, for example, talking about a future meeting between Israelis and Palestinian officials, maybe in the future, maybe with regional actors, as it was discussed, Another option that were some reports that maybe there will be some confidence building measure. For example, that Israel will agree to some Palestinian presence in crossing point in Allenby, for example, in order to try to strengthen uh, the Palestinian Authority and some concrete steps uh, like that. And just the last point I would like to mention is East Jerusalem. It will be interesting to see Biden visiting East Jerusalem, for example, a Palestinian hospital in East Jerusalem. And I remember that Blinken, for example, when he visited Israel a few months ago, he visited also East Jerusalem and he met with Palestinian civil society and the America House in East Jerusalem. It, and I think it's time to send a message that we didn't open the consulate, but at least we want to show that we have a different policy on East Jerusalem. Great, great. Really, really interesting, Lior. Thank you so much. And I think that, you know, when we talk about the Palestinian issue and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict specifically, this is something that has actually really called into question a lot of how Israel is seen as a democracy, how Israel is actually seen as a global power throughout the rest of the world and, and especially in the United States. And so, I'd like to actually move to our next speaker, Michael Kuplau from Israel Policy Forum, to talk to us a little bit about Israel's perception in the United States as a liberal democracy in particular. We know that between the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, also Israel's muted response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, for example, that this perception has come into question uh, to, to say the least recently, I would say, has that perception changed um, in your view and how do you view the status specifically within the US government or, or within the public? 
Thanks, Victoria, and uh, great, great to be on this panel alongside uh, so many, uh, so many distinguished and, uh, and, and and smart analysts. So I think there are a number of things going on in terms of the U.S. perspective on Israeli democracy, uh, and in some ways they um, they point in different directions. On the one hand, there has been a really strong sense in the United States over the past year from when the Bennett Lapid government was established that this was a good sign for Israeli democracy, not only because it um, turned out to be very temporarily, but temporarily ended the cycle of ongoing elections, but also because it was this unprecedented eight party coalition and particularly because it included Ram as the first independent Arab party to ever uh, be part of an Israeli coalition. And so um, in the United States, a, a really big deal was made uh, of that and particularly the Ram angle. Um, and I think that that gave not only Bennett and Lapid a boost in terms of their own relations with the United States um, and with a, new, uh, with a new democratic president, but I think it also gave Israel's image a boost in the United States too. On the other hand, um, you know, and so many of these issues that we'll be talking about today are connected, you know, there is, of course, um, the ongoing Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the way in which that shapes American perceptions as well. Um, and it isn't simply about the fact that the conflict remains unresolved. There are all sorts of aspects of it that uh, have caused, I think, a sense in the United States and particularly on the left that Israeli democracy and perhaps even more so Israeli liberalism are not as robust as people uh, as people may have may have thought before, um, and you know we have seen this recently uh, as well, um, just in the past few days, um, in terms of the Shirin Abu Akla investigation uh, and and killing, um, where the USSC, the U.S. Security Coordinator uh, based in Jerusalem, was given access to the bullet and conducted uh, its own investigation. Um, an investigation that did not please either side uh, because um, they could not make a forensic determination, but still said that it was most likely that uh, an Israeli uh, an Israeli shot was the one that killed Shirin Abu Akla, but also um, that uh, that it was probably done by accident. And so the Palestinians, of course, reacted poorly to the second part. Uh, the Israelis reacted poorly to the first part. But the fact that um, she was killed has caused um, a lot of angst in the United States. Um, and the fact that there is a perception that Israel has dragged its feet on investigations into this or into the killing of Omar Assad, another American citizen uh, who was killed during a stop in the West Bank a few months ago, that causes a perception in the United States uh, that there is um, something wrong uh, or going wrong with Israeli democracy. And there's also been a lot of attention paid to issues such as uh, evictions in Masaf Rayata, um, and, you know, there in particular, I think it's important to understand that in the past, many Americans would have looked at that case and said, um, okay, the Israeli Supreme Court has ruled that evictions in Masaf Ayata are okay, and so Israeli democracy is working, even if we don't like the results. I think now that there, there is more of a tendency to look at that and say, um, it's not a sign that Israeli democracy is working, but perhaps a sign um, that the Israeli Supreme Court is also uh, losing its status as a, as a democratic or liberal institution. Um, and then, of course, uh, on top of this, there, you know, there are the charges that um, in many ways originated in Israel uh, with B'Tselem, but moved on to Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International of Israeli apartheid. And um, that's a discourse that you see increasingly in the United States, particularly on the left, um, you know, questioning, questioning whether, uh, whether it is in any way accurate to talk about Israeli democracy. Um, and to effectively uh, portray any Israeli actions as consequences of an Israeli system of apartheid. Um, and so, you know, I think that you, you do have these, these two trends, one uh, with the, the former Israeli government that was pointing uh, for many people in the, in the United States in a more democratic direction and trends on the other side that are, that are pointing the other way. Um, the last thing I'll note is that there is also um, a discourse on the left in the United States, 
surrounding uh, region and regional normalization in the Abraham Accords, uh, I know a subject that we'll, we'll touch on uh, later, later in this webinar, um, this notion that it is effectively uh, an alliance built um, on authoritarianism, um, that you have Israel normalizing relations with a number of authoritarian states. And um, that's a, a critique that you see on the left. And I think that it's probably going to be raised again next week in uh, the wake of President Biden's visit to Israel, since he is then going to Saudi Arabia, and he has also linked uh, the visit to Israel and the visit to Saudi Arabia in some of his public comments. Um, I think there you are likely to see some folks on the left uh, make noise about the fact um, that, uh, that again, you have this alliance of alleged authoritarian, authoritarian states and that, uh, and that the relationship between Israel and Saudi Arabia um, is being used as a way um, to give cover to, uh, to a very authoritarian Saudi Arabia um, by establishing better relationships with Israel. And uh, as I said, that's, that's the sort of thing that comes under criticism uh, from the left as well. So, um, you know, I, as, I, as I said, I think, I think it's moving, moving in both directions, but there are definitely increasing numbers of people in the United States who are no longer willing to take Israeli democracy at face value. That's great. And that actually kind of brings me to a quick follow up question for you. You know, we're talking about this balance between uh, the left and, and its own perception of Israel, but we also know that Israel traditionally has been seen as a bilateral issue and uh, bipartisan, not bilateral, bipartisan issue. And, and who knows, maybe, maybe this is actually starting to change nowadays as well. But in general, you know, how important would you say it is that America perceives Israel as a democracy in the first place for bolstering those relations, for, um, you know, engaging in new, is, is, is it really important or is the fact that Israel is our, our strongest partner in the Middle East, uh, the, the underlying and, and the, at the, the bottom line at the end of the day? I think it's hugely important. The, the key difference between the U.S.-Israel relationship versus U.S. relationship with a country like Saudi Arabia or uh, a country like like Pakistan or a country like the UAE, um, you know, all of whom have, uh, in different ways, strong economic or military relationships with the United States, is that Israel has always been viewed as different um, because of this notion that the United States and Israel are both democracies and share a common set of values, um, and you know that more than anything else has made the U.S. relation U.S. Israel relationship. Um, robust and uh, I, I think um, institutionalized sort of at all levels from the president down to um, Congress, down to the US national security and diplomatic bureaucracy and down to societal ties. Um, and, and really that, that part has made the US-Israel relationship, I think not only extraordinarily strong and robust and special, but um, for decades impervious to different political trends. And I think there's a real danger to Israel when it comes to US-Israel relations, if a perception takes hold that Israel is simply um, another, another Sparta in the Middle East, um, and that the US-Israel relationship is only based on interest and not based on, on values and shared commitments to democracy. And I'll also note as an American, I think that um, uh, the, the, the question of American commitment to democracy is, uh, is also, uh, is also uh, at play here. Um, but in terms of U.S.'s relations specifically, um, if, if that aspect is lost, I think that uh, U.S.'s relations uh, you know, a decade from now uh, are going to look very different and, and the relationship itself um, will suffer enormously. So it's, it's, a, it's a very important aspect that I think should not be underplayed. Awesome, thank you so much, Michael. And actually, um, Tal, not to, not to put you on the spot, but I'm just wondering if maybe on, on the same topic, you have some insights too of just how you see this issue of democracy impacting US-Israel relationship or what this balancing act kind of, kind of looks like for, for the relationship. Any, anything to add? What do you mean specifically? So when we're talking about the perception of Israel as a democracy and the mm. importance of Israel appearing as a democracy for the U.S.-Israel relationship, do you do you see this as something dynamic, something pretty critical to the relationship, um, especially in light of our, our fun uh, path towards elections yet again? Yeah, we do have this problem here of the, of the fifth election. I think it doesn't portray a good image of Israel. Um, you know, so, so people are happy about uh, being able to go to elections and so on, but too much elections, it's also uh, collapsing democracy. 
I am worried about that. I'm not sure this, this is um, covered or this is in the media's attention. You know, I'm, I'm following the, you know, the US media. I do not think that people outside of Israel under, understand what's going on here. I don't think that's the case. So if you ask how, what's the impact is, yeah, I don't, I don't know how deep is the understanding of, of the political crisis that is ongoing here in Israel. Um, it's hardly, I mean, it, it became boring even to Israelis, but obviously to, to the media outlets in the United States. So uh, it's it definitely not uh, big headlines. Um, as per the, the visit and the, you know, the American approach at the moment with respect to this uh, crisis. As I said, you know, Biden will have to meet the other side and Mr. Netanyahu. I know everybody understands that the Israeli people, not a little bit more than 50% uh, have um, denied Netanyahu the opportunity to, to still be the prime minister for, for election cycles. Uh, I think uh, Biden will try to avoid any pretense of uh, getting himself involved in election. We do know the history of Clinton coming to the Taba um, uh, discussions during a, a campaign. The, um, you know, I, I do remember uh, Netanyahu's trip to the United States when Trump was running and he, and he met with both Clinton and, and, uh, and Trump back in, that was like kind of September 20, 2016. And, uh, yeah, it was uh, Israel's, you know, he had to do it, but it was not done in the best way, I would say. But right now, I mean, we are in a situation where we cannot be saved from ourselves, right? We need, we need to do it ourselves to save our own democracy. Nobody is going to come over and save, rescue the Israeli democracy at the moment. And then it needs to be done from within. And... <laughs> You know, United States cannot contribute to that to that process. So that's a big problem for us. Absolutely, awesome. Thank you. Um, so moving on next to Meet Beam's CEO, Dr. Gil Murciano. Um, Gil, Michael actually talked a little bit, and and Tal did too. Of uh, you know, Biden is coming to Israel is part of this much larger visit. Most importantly, um, heading over to Saudi Arabia, and we can really see the context of this visit, especially considering the recent headline that the talks with Iran, the nuclear talks with Iran have collapsed um, and they've walked away and we, we don't have a new agreement on the table. So what can you tell us a little bit about how Biden's visit is relating to the Iranian issue, if at all? Um, and where does Israel come, in, come into the mix between the two? Right. I mean, the fact that we are dealing with Iran as uh, last but not least in this discussion is already, you know, a difference from previous. If we compare it with the Blinken visit in March and the earlier visits, um, I don't think that if you would ask Biden or his team, they would like to place Iran on a high place in the priority list. Uh, there's very little to offer to gain. You mentioned the stagnation or even more than just stagnation, the deterioration of the negotiations over a new JCPOA or a new nu nuclear deal. But unfortunately, I think that, you know, it takes two to tango and both in Saudi Arabia and in Israel, as Tal mentioned, the station on the road to, the, to, 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 to Saudi Arabia, uh, the topic of Iran is still considered as a litmus test to the geopolitical commitment of the U.S., whether or not the uh, rumors or whether the concepts of uh, a U.S. withdrawal from the region are, are real or not. It's something that should be calculated altogether. I think that Biden is going to be probably the, the first American president to visit the Middle East in a time where Iran is a de facto nuclear threshold country. I know it's a little bit of a provocation here, but this is a time where Iran, its ability to reach nuclear, military nuclear capabilities, it depends mostly not on its capabilities, but on its motivations, on an Iranian decision altogether. I think that what, what, what we see in the negotiations over the nuclear issue is one major point of potential escalation. We are talking not just about the, uh, the fact that the negotiations are not moving forward, but on a change in Iranian position, in a hard power position that basically moves from a gradual erosion of the agreements into an open uh, position of non-compliance. 
the symbolic uh, uh, step basically was dismantling the cameras uh, in the nuclear sites in Iran, you know, that were monitored by the JCPOA. Uh, we are talking about an I, a IAEA report that uh, speaks about more than 40 kilograms of uh, enriched uranium and 60% uh, level of quality. Very, very close to a point of no return when it comes to capabilities. Um, we are talking about the fact that we have a basic question about the motivation of the parties to move right now, to move forward and try to solve the issues from the American point of view with the meetings coming in November, a very sensitive issue. Uh, I'm not really sure if there's, there's going to be a, a motivation to deal with it right now or to offer new compromises on the a, on the Iranian side, quite surprisingly, a very, very harsh discourse against any compromise, including a demand to see a mechanism that would prevent a future a withdrawal of the US, a future, a future uh, a defection from the, from the agreement. So that's one major, major, major point of escalation. And this is also a decision-making juncture for Biden, for the Western world right now, what to do with this new policy of, of uh, non-compliance, Snapshot, I mean, the entire idea of bringing the topic into to the uh, Security Council of the UN is quite odd at these times, uh, but that's obviously one question where Biden is going to be asked by the Saudis, by the Israelis, definitely. But the second issue and the second point of escalation is really about the regionalism. And this is a question that might be as relevant to Saudi Arabia as to Israel. I mean, the last couple of months we've seen, I would say, a Gradually also escalation on the level or, or the features of the, the Israel-Iranian and Iranian regional confrontation. Um, uh, we spoke about cyber, we spoke about what we recently experienced in Turkey with a, a direct uh, exchange of blows between, uh, on, uh, between Israeli intelligence efforts and Iranian uh, uh, IRGC efforts and so on. But I think one of the main topics is definitely uh, drones and UAVs. Um, in the last couple of months, attempts by Iran, according to different sources, to use these platforms to attack Israeli targets or to supply uh, weapons to Gaza a couple of days ago, Hezbollah attempt to, more as a signaling uh, attempt, to send drones um, to uh, state to provide a certain message about Israeli drilling, gas drilling uh, in Karish, not so far away from the Lebanese border, not necessarily an Iran-sanctioned uh, effort, but something that probably was coordinated on that level. So we see the parties moving from a warfare between proxies into a much closer proximity, a, a, a clash or friction between the parties. And when we deal with those two topics, those are two topics that definitely sit on the, uh, very high on the set of priorities of, uh, of Saudi Arabia and Israel. Now, the third element here is that the Biden visit comes in a time where the discussion over regional cooperation on strategic issues, on security issues, really, is something that we see becoming more and more a reality. And now, you know, some people like Bennett, our former prime minister, refer to it as a, a Middle Eastern NATO. You know, I wouldn't go that far, obviously, uh, the idea of collective security in our region. But we have discussion, Gantz mentioned that the Israeli Minister of Defense just last month, the idea of forming, for example, a regional cooperation vis-a-vis -vis Iran on air defense, an air defense alliance, an effort that is seemingly backed by the US. Uh, we've seen cooperation between the countries of the region vis-a-vis -vis Iran, not just on the military level, also on the political level. If we refer to the supply of gas to Lebanon through an effort combining Israel, Egypt, Jordan, also in some way Syria, in order not to provide Iran the vacuum to enter and to uh, gain more traction in the Lebanese arena. So we've seen all those efforts, which are carried mostly by local uh, and regional uh, actors. And there's the big question, what is the US role within this framework? You know, I mean, is it, is it a, a role of supportive idea or it's, a, it's more of a leadership idea? I think this question is crucial also for the long-term success of those efforts. I mean, with all due respect to regional cooperation on security, the ability of those countries, Saudi Arabia, UAE, to cooperate with Israel on security affairs, countries that have a very long border with Iran, countries that has an intense vulnerability, their trade routes, their uh, production installation, as we've seen in 2019 with the attack on Aramco in Saudi Arabia, 
are very vulnerable and the ability to cooperate or the ability to build any kind of security cooperation of the countries of the region vis-a-vis -vis Iran, vis-a-vis -vis other threats, is de really depends on US backing on their level. And you know, if I have to wrap up maybe the first part of this discussion and take it even beyond the Iranian issue due to the regional issue, you know, we, we've, been, we've been talking about a, a, a shifting leadership, leadership role of the US in the Middle East against the backdrop of all kinds of uh, a, a discussions over US reprioritization, US withdrawal from the region. But we always spoke about a shifting role between leading from behind versus leading from the front seat. And this Biden visit is very important, again, to the countries of the region, I think, as a litmus, as a litmus test to, to really see and examine whether we are talking about a change in American position from a leadership position to a supportive role. And this goes to a number of different fields, Israeli-Lebanon and negotiations that are handled by the US, major efforts on that level, but also in regards to the idea of strategic cooperation, something that we started with, with the Negev summit, we've seen developing, and the US component here is quite important. And that's part, partially the important issue. So Iran is not the major topic, but it's a great litmus test in the so-called implicit discussion between the US and the countries of the region, including Israel, in that sense. Great, thank you so much, Gil. And, and now I'm gonna start transitioning us into some of the, the questions specifically from, from the audience. So again, everyone feel free to, to send your questions in the chat and I'm gonna go ahead and make sure that we, we spotlight all of our speakers. Um, but first of all, the one question that we've been getting, I think, Lior, this would be great for you, maybe Michael, if you want to comment on it after as well, um, is do we think that Biden is going to upgrade the relationship with the Palestinian Authority at all during this trip or anytime soon? And, and even more specifically, um, is it true that if Biden meets with Abbas um, in Bethlehem, it would be the first visit by US president to the occupied Palestinian territories. Um, that's a question we got from the audience. So we are Michael, uh, take it away. Uh, thank you, Victoria. Yeah, I saw these two questions, I would be glad to address them. Uh, so first of all, the second question, no, we actually all the US presidents since the beginning of Oslo visited at some point the Palestinian Authority. We remember, for example, Clinton had a very significant visit in Gaza at the end of the 90s when it was a big ceremony of the Palestinian National uh, Parliament changing the Palestinian Convention. Also Bush visited Bethlehem, I think 2008. And by the way, also Trump visited, uh, met, he met actually with Abbas three times. They met in, in the US twice and once in Bethlehem. It was doing this year, only after a year after moving the embassy, every, they got into a rift, but actually they met at the beginning. And so it's not the first visit. I would say about upgrading the relation, it's of course the question of how we can consider upgrading. So as I said, comparing to Trump, we can see a significant step because they recover the relation. We have relation between US and the Palestinian Authority after the three years of disconnect. They renew uh, the aid. We can see some first steps trying to help the Palestinian Authority, trying to strengthen the Palestinian relation with them. But, but of course, on the other hand, some of the points I mentioned, they didn't open the consulate. It was very, very clear for the Palestinians. This is supposed to be the first steps, very basic. And they didn't open, again, the PLO office in DC that is considered very basic. So we can see that they are trying to compensate in different ways, trying to make a new structure in order to say, we are creating a new relation with the Palestinian without doing these steps. And this is something that is still concerned in the Palestinian side. Uh, I would just also uh, mention that there is also the question of the democratic crisis in the Palestinian Authority. And we can see that usually the European, European are more criticizing the Palestinian Authority comparing to the US and the Biden administration. But we can see that during some of the visits they are trying to meet with the Palestinian civil society in order to show that we are not speaking just with Ramallah and the Mukata, we are also showing the Palestinian society that we would like to talk with other sections in the Palestinian uh, society, not just the Palestinian Authority, because we know they are not very popular at the moment and there is some problem with the democratic crisis in the Palestinian Authority. Um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just add to that, that uh, the Palestinians have been pretty consistent in putting forth a list of um, requests or, or demands from the US that they want to see from 
President Biden's visit, and um, it's I'll, I'll, I'll say unlikely, but but the more accurate term is probably um, uh, impossible for uh, for all of them, or maybe even any of them, uh, to be fulfilled. You know, the things that they've been asking for, of course, uh, number one is the consulate, and, and that's that's simply not going to happen um, on this visit. And uh, I think there's a good chance that it doesn't happen at all. Um, you know, they they do want the PLO mission uh, reopened in Washington, but that is subject to. Uh, I think, as, uh, as, as was noted earlier, subject to all sorts of legal restrictions uh, in terms of congressional legislation that would have to be uh, amended or repealed. That's actually not something that President Biden can even do unilaterally. Um, they want the PLO to be taken uh, off of the U.S. terrorist list. Um, you know, that's that's also uh, certainly not going to happen. Certainly not going to happen now. Um, and uh, you know, in terms of uh, all sorts of funding things, um, that's also subject to uh, the Taylor Force restrictions in the United States. Which again are a matter for for Congress, um, not something that the president can do on his own. And so I think part of the issue here is that we, when we talk about upgraded relations with the Palestinians, the gap between what President Biden is actually able to do on his own um, and uh, and what he can't do on his own um, is pretty big. And the the Palestinians uh, either. Um, Either, either are uh, avoiding that fact, or uh, you know, or, uh, are choosing to um, choosing to, to make a political issue of it. So, um, I, you know, I think in some ways they're setting themselves up for failure. There are a number of ways in which the uh, the Biden administration, I think, is attempting to upgrade relations with the Palestinians within the context of what it's able to do on its own, and within the context of not wanting to do things that will uh, put Prime Minister Lapid in a, in a tough spot, um, you know, which will, I'm, I'm certain, include uh, announcements about funding to East Jerusalem hospitals. Um, you know, they have attempted to, uh, as was mentioned earlier, they have attempted to um, float the idea of appointing Hadi Amar as a special, uh, as a special representative to the Palestinians, a uh, move that uh, reportedly the Palestinians rejected um, because it doesn't go far enough. Um, and you know, I think it's also important to note that uh, this administration has resumed funding to UNRWA, something that um, you know uh, is not popular with Republicans in the United States. Um, certainly, isn't uh, publicly popular with uh, with Israeli politicians and the Israeli government, irrespective of what may or may not be said behind the scenes. So, you know, there are many ways I think in which this administration has upgraded relations with the Palestinians and, and wants to do more to do more. Um, but the, the expectations the Palestinians have um, are just not things this administration will fulfill uh, and in some cases can't. Um, and so to me, it's more a question of whether the Palestinians are willing to take things and spin them as wins and spin them as upgrades and, um, and try to tell a story in which they're getting some of what they want, even if they're not getting everything they want, or if they're going to uh, they're going to use this visit um, as part of a narrative where the U.S. you know is, is continually continuously letting them down, um, and this notion that there's no difference between President Biden and President Trump. Um, so far, the signals we've seen are the latter. But I think that if uh, if the PA wanted to switch gears, they could certainly make the case that uh, that relations um, are on the upswing. Great, awesome, thank you. Um, to go back to perhaps maybe the elephant in the room for a, a lot of Americans when it comes to President Biden visiting this, uh, this region in general, um, Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is, is very much a country that the United States government and, and President Biden himself criticized really for years as a major, major violator of, of human rights. Um, and yet, now it seems to be a bit of a 180 choosing to, to come visit uh, Saudi Arabia. And so interested in whoever um, wants to take this, but you know, how is the Biden administration trying to balance this? Is there any balancing? Is there a way to, to make it look like it's not a complete 180 in, in this regard? And, and if so, um, how successful do you envision President Biden being able to, to twist that? Tal, go for it. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, Israeli, the Israeli government is following very, very closely all of this development. Um, first of all, I might say, I think there will be a photo between Biden and MBS. Uh, that's for sure. I mean, uh, the Department of uh, the, the White House spokesman was asked about that. And she said, you know, uh, she basically said it cannot be avoided. So this is a, going to be a big, you know, achievement for MBS to be on the same photo, forget a photo op. 
with the president, that means, you know, to the world and to the region and to Turkey, that means forgiveness or whatever. Um, you know, Israel, um, Israel has been selling the Pegasus NSO software to the Saudis. We all know that by now, this company is listed in the Department of uh, Finance, I think, uh, blacklist uh, companies not to do business with, or commerce, I'm sorry, the commerce uh, listing. Um, you know, there is no any, we don't know, I mean, it's listed because of what, what's going, what's taking on in, in between Israel, Saudi and the Turkish with respect to the use of the Pegasus, obviously. Um, I don't think there is a request from the Israeli side to take this company off the list. But obviously, if uh, there is a connection between the three countries and there is a commercial connection, and we do see here in Israel the beginning of people who are traveling, business people who are traveling to Saudi Arabia. We've seen, we've seen that in the last couple of weeks, Israeli business people are traveling to Saudi and to us, uh, uh, and, and uh, we did see two reporters this week, just I think two days ago, traveling and broadcasting from the markets and from the streets. So this is definitely the beginning of something. And if Israel, Israel is, is looking forward for, um, you know, Israel wants to have, to have them part of the uh, Abraham Accords. I don't think it's going to happen in this trip. But when you see business people and the um, reporters that are going, entering the country without a problem at all, uh, both, both of the reporters have um, foreign passports uh, and both of them are prominent reporters, well known. They have European passports or something. They, they, entered, they entered the country with, with uh, not with an Israeli passport, but definitely we all know, I mean, we've seen it for years happening with the Emirates. I mean, Israel ha Israelis have been traveling back and forth. The countries has, have made the business connection way before the formal connections were done. So if you are, you know, if you have eyes in your head and you are looking to the region, you see this connection beginning to work in order to have something that will have take place in a couple of years from now, I don't know. and. You know, I think the Americans want to be the um, the kingmaker of that. They don't want to be on the side. They want to be engaged in that, you know, event. They don't want the uh, Saudis to get close with uh, the Russians at the moment or the Chinese. They want to be hands-on in this business and, and regional and economic development. So I guess Biden don't have much choices to my understanding. Hey, go, go for it. Yeah, no, I mean, Tal mentioned the, uh, also the political issue. I think the attempt to have a pro-democratic values or pro democratic values led policy at the start of the Biden administration vis-a-vis uh, -vis Egypt, vis-a-vis -vis Saudi Arabia is kind of, uh, I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a part of, it's a aspect of the past. I mean, as part of an attempt, and this is a, a, an interest we haven't mentioned before, to make sure to maintain US uh, influence in places like Saudi Arabia, by the way, also UAE, and make sure that the increasing production on, of oil and gas, the energy aspect, which is one of the most important in relation to this visit is being maintained. Certain compromises in this specific field of uh, democratic values were, always, were obviously uh, provided. I mean, in many ways, it's kind of a strike one for democracy in Europe, in relation to Ukraine, is some on the expense of a strike one against democracy uh, when it comes to US uh, foreign policy in our region, in the Middle East. But I think, you know, part of the discussion is, is about the issue of normalization with the Saudis and the US leading some kind, either a gradual or some kind of a dramatic normalization between Israel and Saudi Arabia. And there's a good question, by the way, whether or not this is such an important thing uh, for Israelis, whether it is, it is a really dramatic issue. As Tal mentioned, if you need to describe the relations between Israel, Israel and, the, and, the, and Saudi Arabia today, it's not relations under the surface or above the surface, it's on the level of the surface. Everybody knows. Israelis are flying above Saudi uh, area. If you follow the Tehran Straits discussion right now, the uh, Israeli, uh, um, US, Saudi, negotiations over the transfer of the, the Tehran Islands 
uh, with the, that were conducted in Egypt. So basically Israel already kind of enjoys the fruits of partial normalization with the Saudis. Of course, security cooperation is a decade long story. So what is the real value? And this is maybe the optimistic part about it. And this is maybe where the Palestinians also enter. The fact that we are talking about two leaders, Biden on the one hand and uh, Lapid on the other hand, that are somewhat living in the political shadows of the predecessors when it comes to regional policy and breakthroughs. So if the value of normalization with the Saudis was mostly symbolic or maybe even partial beforehand, the ability of Lapid to show um, that he has the same statecraft or ability to bring a major and dramatic step such as some level of normalization or some progress with the Saudis. The ability of President Biden to show that he has actually reg a regional policy and the ability to promote a dramatic, at least symbolically a dramatic step, might bring this topic or might put a political value over some kind of a a apparent or some kind of a symbolic a, a, a success on that level. I'm not sure that within the limits of this visit, they will be able uh, to achieve it. And here comes the Palestinian issue. The Saudis have been pretty strong and been pretty consistent about not supplying symbolic gestures or symbolic uh, um, uh, steps or progress without being paid uh, without expecting something in return of the Palestinian issue, the Arab peace initiative, tradition, and so on. And there's an open question whether or not such a, a motivation to see normalization on this, between Israel and Saudi Arabia by the Israelis and Americans might cause or might bring with it a willingness to show something <laughs> on the Israeli-Palestinian level. I'm not talking about freezing settlements. I'm talking about mostly abstaining for doing certain things. E1, uh, other issues that could be some even trust building measures to the Palestinians. So combining the two in this specific political moment, again, a political moment, not necessarily because of geopolitical considerations might be an interesting thing. Awesome, thanks Gil. So moving on to, to our next question, I think Michael, this one might, might be great for you is, specifically behind the issue of the ongoing war in Ukraine. Um, and again, for a while, it really seemed that the, the US government was unhappy to say the least with the Israeli government's response. Um, and that's probably true for, for many liberal democracies in, in the West. Um, you know, Israel not necessarily signing on as a co-sponsor to UN resolutions right away not fully adopting Western policies in the first place, et cetera, et cetera. So um, has this topic really affected Israel's perception as a democracy, either within the American government or within the American public? And, and do you envision it maybe coming up um, in Biden's visit next week? I don't think it impacted uh, the view in the United States of, of Israeli democracy. Um, it did impact views in the United States of Israel's willingness to to get on board with American priorities, which you know is, is obviously not um, not the same not the same thing. Um, particularly in the beginning, there was a lot of discontent, uh, given the U.S. position, given the NATO position, um, and you saw it uh, you saw it interestingly, both from Democrats and from Rep Republicans, including some Republican voices, um, who, you know, who generally are uh, relatively loath to criticize the Israeli government or Israeli actions. I think that a number of things have happened since then. Um, first of all, uh, time has passed and Americans have um, famously short attention spans. And so I think in some ways that, uh, that, is, that is working, working in Israel's favor. Um, second, you know, there has been increasing tension between Israel and Russia um, over their own bilateral issues, including all sorts of unfortunate uh, Russian government references to Zelensky as a Nazi uh, and you know comparing uh, you comparing uh, things to the Holocaust um, you know and, and we saw lots of pushback there public pushback um, from the Israeli government on Russia and I think that um, that uh, that tended to alter in some ways the perception in the United States that Israel was siding with Russia or um, you know or, or was completely neutral um, Third, I think that the success of the Ukrainian military, which you know certainly surprised many people in the United States, uh, has also taken off some of the, the pressure and some of the alarm that was felt early on 
uh, from US policymakers that if everybody didn't get on board, the Ukrainians would, uh, would quickly be overrun, which uh, turned out not to be the case. Um, and fourth, I think there's also a better understanding now uh, about the ways in which different countries can assist. You know, there was lots of loose talk early on about um, Iron Dome, right? Why isn't Israel providing, providing Iron Dome uh, to Ukraine? You know, mostly because people didn't understand that um, in that situation, Iron Dome would, would be relatively useless, right? It's, you know, a weapon that's meant for um, a very distinct type uh, type of threat um, and a very, uh, in a very small space. And that is not the case. Uh, with Russia and Ukraine, you know, unless you have literally thousands of Iron Dome batteries to deploy across the country. Um, so I think, you know, there's a better understanding of that. Um, and, you know, I'll say that the Israeli government has also done, I think, a good job, um, both of stressing the humanitarian contributions it's making, uh, and also of increasing the amount of non-lethal aid it was providing. And so, you know, there are still issues that arise. There was a report a few weeks ago um, about uh, an American, uh, I think it was anti-tank, uh, missile system um, that they wanted to provide to the Ukrainians, but because it relies on Israeli technology, it needed Israeli approval, and the Israeli government didn't, didn't give that approval. And so, um, you know, there certainly still is tension over this, but um, I, I doubt it will be something that is terribly high on President Biden's radar during the trip, whereas, you know, four months ago, uh, it would have been a much bigger deal. Definitely. And actually, while we're, while we're on this topic of Israel and Russia, Israel and the United States, um, I think it makes sense to bring in the, the concept of the global power game really in, in our region and in Israel specifically. Do um, maybe Gil, maybe Michael, um, do you envision that China is going to be something that gets discussed during this visit? Um, and Turkey is another one that has come up a lot recently. How maybe will this competition between the global powers come up, if at all? It, maybe it won't come up at all, but this is definitely something that we're starting to see more specifically to the Middle East. And to combine it actually with another question, um, there's sometimes questions that if the Middle East is something even that the average American cares about at all. And so I think on, on that same note, just seeing the impacts of something like the war in Ukraine on the Middle East, on the United States, and really on the entire world, how do we kind of balance this global power competition with maybe what, what the average Joe is, is thinking back home? Well, I don't know about the average Joe, about the, you know, the right place to say anything about the average Joe, but I think, you know, we think, we speak a lot about the Middle East in terms of this visit, but I think that we can define it in many ways as a maintenance visit, not just in the Middle East, but also the Red Sea and the Mediterranean in many ways. Um, you mentioned the Chinese. I think part of the somewhat of an erosion in the U.S. Uh, geopolitical position in the region can be shown by an increasing uh, role uh, for China as a competitor, not so much on the military uh, level, but obviously on a political level, especially when it comes to countries like the UAE. You know, when it comes to acquiring uh, uh, Chinese weapons, even speaking about the Chinese base in, U in the UAE. And the same goes to Sudan, to places that are not necessarily on our map. But I think at least in the discussion with the Saudis, those are topics that definitely would come up. The importance of the Red Sea. Uh, so this is part of a much more geopolitical discussion when it comes to, uh, when it comes to the US. Uh, I'll add to that, that the one issue that was really contentious between the Trump administration and the Israeli government was the question of Israel-China. Um, you know, it was it was the one area where uh, even even um, President Trump uh, threatened to uh, actually sanction Israel um, if it did not uh, if it did not halt some of its relationship with China. Um, you know, there were concerns over uh, over the military relationship, the economic relationship. So you know, it, it's certainly something that um, U.S. policymakers from both parties are keeping an eye on, and I think that you know, there's generally a desire. To um, to keep uh, keep Israel firmly in the Western camp, but I, I don't think it's something that um, I don't think it's something that uh, that President Biden is particularly worried about. There there isn't there isn't a widespread fear in the U.S. that Israel is somehow you know in in a going to be forced into a choice between the U.S. and China, and that and that Israel is going to choose China. I think there are concerns about very specific technology transfers, um, very specific reliance on Chinese technology, concerns about uh, giving China. Uh, a foothold in Israel 
whether uh, whether it's it's running ports or building infrastructure, um, you know, given how much cooperation there is on intelligence uh, and defense between the U.S. and Israel. So I think you know it, it's very specific things, but there is no widespread concern about um, about the Chinese Israel relationship in terms of where where Israel will land. Great, thank you, um, Lior. This this question is is for you. Mainly, are there specific red lines that you think the Biden administration is for sure going to bring up with this visit with the with the Israeli government specifically? Do we think he's just going to keep towing the line? And at the same time, do we think that the Biden administration is going to have pressure from other regional players um, to say something or, or to push certain issues when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Victoria. Yeah, I can say that uh, it was interesting. A week ago, there was published an interview with a former advisor of Bennett, Shibrit Meir. And the interesting part in this, in this interview was she actually said that there was a lot of pressure from the Biden administration on the issue of settlement. And then, of course, all the journalists dealing with the diplomatic aspect said that comparing, uh, he, she said that even more than Obama, when, of course, this is not true. And we can see that there was almost no public statements on this issue, even though we know that the closed door, they were involved. I know in the issue of East Jerusalem, they were very, very closely following a lot of developments and were able to stop some specific issues like Atarot, that was very, very strategic uh, issues. And I think that in general, even though we saw expansion of settlement, uh, I think that Bennett even tried to brag that he, he did even more than doing uh, Netanyahu and Trump. But at the same time, we can see that there are some, what we can call like a strategic areas like E1 project, like Atarot, like Givatamatos, that would be the real test. And I think that we can see that Biden, they're not doing it publicly, but they're trying more to do it, to have the influence with this specific government. Maybe by the way with Netanyahu, it can be different, but trying to at least to stop some kind of steps in this area, saying, okay, we are not trying to promote an Israeli-Palestinian final status agreement, but at least try not to change the situation on the ground, try to make two-state solution possible. So that's why at least in this area, uh, we saw that they were able to do that. E1 is still going on and still they will postpone it for two months, but we still need to follow how, how they were able to do that. On the question of normalization, uh, I must say that we have a project on this issue. And for last year, we had many, many discussion about how to leverage the normalization process in order to promote Israeli-Palestinian peace, even though of course the regional purpose was not, was to bypass the Palestinian, but how we can actually use it. And we over and over again, we reach the same conclusion that actually the Saudis can be a real key point here in order to, as they try to did, I'm not sure what exactly was there, but trying to say, cancel annexation in exchange for normalization to do something similar to that, but something that's more serious than cancel, a normal, cancel the annexation. For example, as Gil mentioned, freezing settlement in exchange for some normalization with the Saudis or things like that or some kind of an other way to link between Palestinian issue and normalization. And I can say that we did a survey in Mitvim a year ago, and we saw that more than 50% of the public actually said that they supported leveraging the normalization process for Israeli-Palestinian peace, even using the word Israeli-Palestinian peace, a word that we are not hearing so much in the Israeli discourse. So we saw that this link between normalization that is very popular in Israel with the Israeli-Palestinian process that's something that I think Biden can actually use that and can actually leverage. There are many obstacles. You have the tension, of course, between the Palestinians and the Gulf states. We, and we have also, of course, the problem with the Israeli politics that we can also talk just about that. But I think still Biden administration, that if they would like to do something, that's something that they can, this is, this is a tool that they can use. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, tall. Coming to you for a second and definitely see that you're going to have to, to leave us soon. So this works perfectly. Um, again, we are heading into political uh, campaign season here in Israel. And at the same time, we have the president of the United States visiting. Um, so it can be very easy for this trip to be made even more political than, than it might be normally. So to what extent do you see different political leaders or parties within Israel using this visit to either promote their agenda, take down others? And, and how do you think Biden will try to minimize being, being used as a, as a political tool, so to speak? 
Yeah, you know, we've seen, we have so many campaigns here in the last couple of years. So we definitely, in all four of them, Netanyahu was the prime minister. And we've seen through his campaigns how he is taking everything he can on the um, policy um, front to recruit it for political points. Um, you know, relationship with Putin, relationship with Trump. I mean, all of the things that Trump did were, you know, concisely made right before election. It, uh, Trump announced that uh, he's considering, in a tweet, he announced it, that he's considering to have a defense pact with Israel that was written in a tweet 48 hours before election day. So uh, they opened up the, um, this, um, I don't know, the village up on the Golan Heights, um, the, the annexation of the Golan Heights, an event in the White House at which I attended, it was done like a couple of weeks before election. Um, so many examples for, for the prior prime minister taking the advantage of, uh, of his, uh, you know, world stage to, to, you know, add some points. I mean, it wasn't even uh, hidden because Netanyahu had a campaign um, that the slogan was a different league or an above league, meaning he is a league above all. And the campaign photos were photos of Netanyahu with Trump and with Putin. It, it, was, it was, you know, hanged all over the countries, like huge posters with Netanyahu's and Putin and Netanyahu and Trump. Uh, the, everything you know that I'm talking about took place before the invasion to Ukraine and before January 6 in in you know in, in the United States. I guess that this will not happen again for uh, definitely for not for Netanyahu. He will not take uh, this type of uh, campaign anymore. But right now he's not the prime minister, and the big question is: Will Yair Lapid? Um, what will he do? I mean, Yair Lapid was uh, finance minister and foreign affairs minister, and he is now the, the, the prime minister only for the last 10 days. And obviously he, he doesn't have this. I mean, he, would, he had a deficit with respect to meeting world leaders or being on the world stage. So the big question is what will he do with Biden's with this footage in the prime minister office and everything where, where the country knows that, that Yair Lapid is only a caretaker uh, prime minister. He's here for now for probably around, you know, four to six months, and we don't know what's next. So will he uh, take advantage of the situation? And I can definitely guarantee to you that no matter what, what we, he will do, I presume the Likud side will claim that he is doing it in order to win. So uh, they already are saying that uh, Lapid is taking advantage of the airtime and in order, I mean, you know, uh, media time in order to portray himself and use it as a campaign uh, tool where Netanyahu is actually the one who invented this system of, of using it, you know, giving speech and speeches and prime times during elections and telling, um, you know, sending reporters. I have a huge important message that has to be, you know, delivered at 8 8 p.m. at night and then only to find out that you know it was just another campaign slogan or something like that so yeah if Lapid will do that he will get you know bashed from the Israeli press after so many years of, of seeing that. Victoria may I add something to this? Sure. I mean it's really interesting the way that foreign policy becomes part of the electoral game in Israel in the last decade you know and Tal mentioned the Netanyahu's very artful way of using it uh, and we've seen, by the way, in the past that uh, when it comes to non-liberal democracies, the kind of gather around is almost a support group. If you remember before the last election, it was Bolsonaro, then Moody, then Putin, by the way, with, with visit should go, and of course, Trump's uh, uh, on support. So you see this type of an attempt to build the, uh, the image of right wing government and kind of shared. Question is if it's also something that can be done by the more liberal democratic sides. Lapid already took the first uh, step with the Elise, with his close friend Macron, with the yesterday's visit. It's something that he also did before the last elections, visiting two days before the elections, uh, showing up at the, at the French premier's uh, uh, yard and so on. 
But the Biden visit is an in interesting uh, part of this uh, of this combination. Can you really speak about some sort of uh, a support, not necessarily for Lapid as a as a person or Lapid as a political leader, but for the values represented and the topics represented by Lapid in difference or from or in in in, in contracts contracts from, from other political leaders in Israel, and that's a question that is going to be asked. But I think. The topic of foreign policy, the fact that foreign policy plays a role in the electoral game, this ship has already sailed. It's going to be part of it. Lapid served as a foreign minister. His ability to build his image is based on his service as a foreign minister throughout the last year. Um, it's going to be interesting to see how the Biden, the Biden visit is going to be combined into this, uh, into this framework. Beautiful. Thanks, Gil. Um, Tal, I know you have to head out, so so thank you so much for joining us. Really amazing to have you here. Um, great, thanks. Okay, great. So to actually to to wrap up with our remaining speakers, I I want to almost get a little creative and and a little idealistic for for a second with all of you, and to ask you. Let's say you're sitting across the table um, with the president or you're sitting with him on Air Force One as he's heading over to the Middle East. What is, you know, the one thing that you would suggest that he says or does during his visit? What would you maybe recommend that he's doing, seeing, talking to while he's here? Um, and since it is kind of the wrap up question, if there's anything else you want to touch on uh, with any of the other topics or questions that we've talked about, um, please feel free. So maybe Lior, we can start with you. Not to put you on the spot or anything with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but. Yeah, I think uh, this is really the toughest topic. Uh, and we know we already mentioned that how much it was clear that this is not a high priority for Biden. But I think that, um, and my, Michael mentioned, there were many expectations for the, in the Palestinian side and a lot of disappointment. So I think that uh, in light of the fact that we have this dramatic visit, it's everything, every step, so everything he will do in the Palestinian issue need to be more than just general statement and more just to show that he did is he talked about two state solution and he met with both sides. It must be some way to create some kind of a new momentum, even though we know and we heard there was some idea to create some kind of a first summit with Israeli, Palestinian, Jordan, and Egypt. And we know that the Israeli side were against it, saying it will raise expectation and nothing will came out of it. I think that the Biden administration need eventually to start thinking about going back what we used to call the roadmap. We are talking about small steps, but eventually to think how it can create a new momentum. We know all the uh, consideration, we know the political timing, but it's still some way to find, to use this visit in order uh, to promote something. I would just add maybe a comment if we are talking about political aspect, and of course, Tal, she's the best expert here. Uh, I'm not an expert on the Israeli politics, but I can say that we have some kind of ironic situation here that on the one hand, it seems like this is the prime minister that we have right now that is actually talking and supporting two-state solution, supporting renewing the negotiation with the Palestinian. That's the first time we have since 2008, 2009. So that's considered a, a significant steps. And I think he also can use it as Gil mentioned, using it as part of his international uh, image. But on the other hand, and I think Biden knows that they're very good, it's really, it's not really the situation because he had this very, very complicated uh, government coalition and it's very, very just a temporary. But I still think that even though that is not going to be the focus of the election campaign, I think this can be a way for uh, also Lapid to try to differentiate him, also to talk to his base that are still, most of them still thinking about the Palestinian issue somehow, not maybe final status agreement, but it's still something that is still important for some of his base. So that can be maybe a way to differentiate himself for the previous Prime Minister Bennett, and at least to show that he's at least doing some steps in this direction. Great. Um, Michael, how about you? I think that um, for, for all the reasons that, that have been mentioned, um, it's unlikely that President Biden is going, going to be able to really move policies forward while he's here. Um, Ahead of an Israeli election in November, you know, even even if Prime Minister Lapid is aligned with Biden um, on many of these issues, uh, you know, I, I think he's not going to want to hand ammunition to uh, to Netanyahu um, and allow uh, Netanyahu, Likud, or anyone else 
to paint him as being uh, weak on security or uh, as giving concessions to, to the Palestinians. So, um, and my guess is that the White House understands that. And you know, we've we've gone over all the reasons why uh, why the Palestinians are, are likely to be disappointed. So, you know, I think that the one thing President Biden can do, and, and I hope that he does, um, is to reframe the way he and the United States, um, in turn, have been speaking about the conflict over the past year. Um, Talking about uh, equal measures of security, freedom and prosperity and dignity and whatever else they sometimes throw in, um, I, I think I think it's important. I think that um, it was important from the beginning to stress that the absence of a peace process and the absence of political solution shouldn't mean that there can't be any progress on the ground. I think that for a long time there was this idea that if you just had the two sides engaging, then you know that was that was the goal and. Um, whatever happened on the ground could wait until until there was a resolution. And so I like that they have adopted a different frame, but I think they've taken it a little too far, right? The idea should have been, and I think probably was from the beginning, that you want to have security, freedom, prosperity for both sides as you are still working towards some sort of political horizon. And they seem to have really dropped the political horizon part. And so I would love to see President Biden, while he is in Israel, um, reframe the conflict in nationalist nationalist terms. Um, reiterate that, that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is one between dueling nationalities, that the only way it's going to be solved is if the national aspirations of each are fulfilled. I think it's particularly important given that in the United States, Zionism is increasingly under assault, not because of Israeli actions, but you know the notion of Zionism's legitimacy itself is under assault. Uh, I think that certainly on the right, the notion that there's any legitimacy to Palestinian nationalism is under assault. You increasingly hear uh, Republicans talking about Palestinian statehood as something that should be permanently off the table. And so I think it's really important to reframe expectations and reframe the way the United States speaks about this. Um, and you know, just to, to add, add one last thing, since you, uh, you asked if there's somebody that's important for him to meet, I would love if while he was here, despite the fact that uh, the government no longer exists, uh, if he would meet um, separately with Mansour Abbas. Um, I think that uh, it's important to try and give credence to the notion that Arab parties um, are, are and should be legitimately uh, members of future coalitions, uh, assuming that they can work in concert with other parties in, in the coalition. I don't take it for granted that just because this has happened once, it's fated to happen forever. Uh, and I think it's really important um, to demonstrate, particularly given that uh, Abbas has been, in my view, um, a responsible uh, member of the coalition, particularly particularly important in that he has openly spoken about um, Israel as a Jewish state and not wanting to challenge Zionism. Um, I think it's really important to give him a boost, even if we want to keep President Biden out of politics, um, you know, and sort of out of meddling in Israeli politics. I think this is one spot um, where I would like to maybe see him do it. Great, thanks. Okay, and then Gil. Last yeah, within the political <laughs> limitations that uh, Michael mentioned, I think that I would actually try to convince President Biden to take, I mean, for the U.S. foreign policy, original policy, to take a more active role in the Abraham, the Abraham Accords, in the normalization, regional normalization process, but not just in deepening or strengthening the relations or adding new countries, but also in somewhat reframing the route of the process, again, not with great dramatic gestures and political steps, trying to, on the practical level, to leverage, to connect against the intentions of the original architects of the, of the accords, to try and connect this quite successful dynamic, I have to say, both in pub public Israeli perception, in leadership, regional leadership perception, not so much the public, um, and to utilize it. And I would start with utilizing success stories, you know, without sticking our neck out too much in a time of transition, uh, focusing on the on the uh, Negev summits, which are now they became from a one-time thing uh, in the Negev in the middle of the summer into uh, a recurrent forum. So if we speak about six subcommittees, from food security to sec uh, to military cooperation and air defense and whatever, you, to try and build under U.S. involvement. And maybe, by the way, with Saudi, uh, uh, with Saudi and Omani uh, um, involvement, to build a seventh subcommittee for Israeli-Palestinian affairs. 
and to maybe try and promote an event attended at least on the level of DGs, director generals, or on a higher level, an event that deals with the potential of the uh, of, of the Abraham Accords to promote Israeli-Palestinian peace. The big impasse here to me will be the Palestinians <laughs> to bring Abu Mazen or any of his people to participate. It is true. Uh, maybe Farage, I don't want to plan the event already. You asked for a general uh, framework. Um, but this is something that I believe would allow and provide the US administration, not just with a unique role, but also a role that is politically tailor-made to the limitations from right and left. You know, within the, and I'm not an expert on American politics, but when we speak with progressive, the progressive part of the Democratic Party, it's not just joining what is considered the property of the Trump administration, but also helping reframing part of the of the policy itself. And that has a promise. Uh, as uh, Leo mentioned, it is definitely, it's an attractive idea from a political, political standpoint in Israel. 53% of Israelis define or, or support utilizing their relations with the uh, normalization countries in order to promote Israeli-Palestinian peace, not conflict shrinking, conflict peace. So the idea of reintroducing the concept of peace based on one of the only success stories or perceived success stories of the last two decades is just too, too attractive to avoid altogether. And it, it might be one of the uh, major, uh, uh, major dynamics we, we can utilize. But I would define the end game. I'm not really sure that a renewal of, of, of negotiations over some comprehensive agreement, I don't think this is part of the discussion, but what you can actually define as an end game for such an, a, a new involvement, a new regional involvement in the Israeli-Palestinian uh, aspect might be practical steps that can change and create political momentum. And this can relate to the goals of the Negev summit, you know? And I think that the combination between the two might be a very interesting concept. Uh, again, you know, a very complicated one because it relates to three political minds, it's Israelis, Palestinians, and regional. So let's try and cover two out of three and the third, well, maybe in the next visit. Beautiful, uh, perfect, perfect way to, to wrap it up, really. Um, thank you so much, everyone, first of all, to all of our guests who, who joined us today. Um, really great to see such uh, amazing turnout and we hope that it's been informative for you. I'd like to especially thank our speakers with a, a special shout out to, to Michael for, for being our guest um, over from, from Israel Policy Forum today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lior. Thank you, Gil. Um, and, and a big thanks to Tal as well. And for, for all of you to know, we did record this webinar, so it will be on our YouTube page um, probably within the next week or so. But Feel free to follow us on social media to make sure that you get those updates and we hope to see you at future ones and uh, we'll see what the visit actually holds and, and I'm sure we'll all have some some interesting analysis and points afterwards so so thank you everyone have a great evening or a great morning wherever you are and we will see you soon. Thank you.